From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. With support from Genentech. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. As usual, I'm your host, Chelsea Judge, Scientific Advisor with the Connor B. Judge Foundation. Just a little refresher for everybody. Um, I am a scientist by background. I have my PhD from Case Western Reserve University. I focused on the research of immunology of infectious diseases, hepatitis C virus, and HIV. And so while I am absolutely devastated by what this new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, which causes the disease COVID-19, has done throughout the world, including leading more than a million and a half deaths and a lot of um, a sorrow in addition to that. We do see some light at the end of this pandemic tunnel with the emergence of these efficacious vaccines, um, one of which was just FDA approved on Friday. So very hopeful. Um, However, we do have some arduous months coming up that's going to require strong following of CDC and state health recommendations, social distancing, mask wearing, and staying vigilant with hygiene. But today, we're going to talk all things vaccines one-on-one with Sumaira from the Sumaira Foundation for NMO. We hear a lot of buzzwords in the news right now. What is a vaccine? Protective immunity, herd immunity, all these different types of vaccines. We'll cover all of that, and we'll talk about the emerging COVID vaccine candidates, as well as the timeline for who gets vaccinated first. Then we'll jump into vaccines and NMO. Dr. Mary Rensel, a neuroimmunologist from the Cleveland Clinic, she is a wonderful clinician who's also very big on patient education, and she's going to walk through some considerations on vaccines and NMO. So Dr. Mary Rensel is also a principal investigator for a number of NMO clinical trials, as well as she's leading a project on looking at COVID and NMO that we were very happy to help contribute to. So Dr. Rensel will talk about some vaccine recommendations for NMO patients, talk about some of the current NMO treatments and how they could affect vaccine response or potential safety concerns, and then discuss any effective vaccines and infections on NMO relapse. So we hope that this is really helpful for you, and let's get started. Sumaira, how are you? I'm so good, Chelsea. How are you? Um, I'm actually much better than I have been (laughs) in the past few very dark months of COVID. Not because we're over the pandemic yet, still got a bit of a ways to go, but because we do see the light at the end of the tunnel now with these really promising vaccine results. Yay! I'm I'm very excited as well. I think that 2021 will definitely be a little bit brighter. And on that note, I kind of just wanted to talk about some basics on um, the science of vaccines, like some basic terminology. Totally. So just to start, um, Sumara, when you think of a vaccine and like what it is, what do you think of? When I think of a vaccine, I think of something that protects humans. Mm -hmm. A vaccine, you know, shows our immune system and it protects us from diseases like infections and what a potential infectious invader looks like so that it can develop a strategy or an army to protect us against it. So I almost think of it like a winter jacket in the winter. Ooh, I like that analogy. Yes, exactly. It's something that prevents you from um, like danger, basically. I like that. Yes. That's, yeah. a, that's a nicer way to look at it. The vaccine, yeah, is just what you said. It's offering you some protection by using your immune system to train or recognize a specific potential infectious invader, in this case, the new coronavirus. And so you have a bunch of cells of your immune system. But the big ones that we focus on when regards to vaccines are your adaptive immune cells, which I think a lot of the NMO warriors are familiar with, the T and B cells, which normally come cause a lot of problems in NMO, but in, with regard to vaccines, we need them. They're the good guys because they will basically create an army of memory-specific cells that will remember what that potential infectious invader looks like, and then they can just roam throughout your body patrolling, looking for anything that's not supposed to be there. So in the case um, your body does come in contact with the infectious invader in this particular case COVID, obviously, these memory immune cells are, they're ready and trained to ward it off so that you don't get sick or at least not as sick. So this is awesome. Yes, I'm very excited. And I think that um, this is going to be life changing for the whole world. Definitely. We keep hearing a lot in the news about herd immunity. And I think that maybe we could just chat about that and what that actually means, because I think there's been a lot of misconceptions around it. 
Definitely. So we heard about herd immunity as like a strategy during the pandemic of like, oh, if we all just got COVID, then it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But that was without vaccines. And Mm -hmm. herd immunity is really actually a vaccine specific concept. We don't like to achieve herd immunity with natural infection because as is playing out with COVID, a lot of people get really sick and die. That's right. A lot of people from our community, actually. Mm, it's very, very, very sad. Yes, we it relies then on the most vulnerable to, to not get sick, which is impossible <laughs> to prevent with natural infection. So herd immunity is really a widespread um, vaccination in a population concept to protect the entire population from that potential inve- infectious fi- invader. In this case, of course, SARS-CoV-2, the bad guy on the block Mm -hmm. that causes the disease COVID-19. So if more or most people in a population have received the vaccine that trained your immune system to what the virus looks like and then allowed for development of that protective immune response, then the virus lost a lot of what I like to think of as like the meat or potential host that it could invade or like bounce around in a population. Does that make sense? Totally. Okay, cool. So basically, herd immunity is with vaccines, and it allows us to have less people to attack so the virus can't spread that well, which is obviously good for everyone because then there's less risk of getting the virus. Which is what we want. Which is what we want. But unfortunately or unfortunately, it relies on people to understand vaccines, feel like they have trust in them, and and willingness to get the vaccine. Which uh, which I hope people are open to. Um, The only way at this point point that we're really going to fight this is by getting vaccinated. Whether you're open to vaccinations or not, I know that there is a lot of debate on this topic. Mm -hmm. I think in this particular situation, because of how desperate we are in a sense as um, a species, really, across the globe, um, these, these vaccines are really going to be very, very crucial to us moving on with our lives. Yep in history, really. You said it best, Myra. This is how we move on and we can achieve whatever the heck normal is again. Right. Yeah. And so I always believe that knowledge is power. And so that if we are very informed, then we can make the best decision for ourselves and others. And that's why we we do this podcast, right? That's right. And so that being said, I thought we'd just very quickly talk about the different types of vaccines that exist, that science has developed. Let's do it. All right, cool. So just very quickly, boom, we generally hear live or heat killed or inactivated um, vaccines. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? I am. Awesome. Sumara, do you know the difference? No. Oh my gosh. Well, then I really appreciate your candidness. So it's what it, it's what it sounds like. So a live virus or a live attenuated virus is a piece of a live active virus and attenuated meaning that, um, it's been clipped and it's not in its full live form, but it's still live virus versus heat killed or inactivated. It means that the virus is not active. It's not live. It's been killed. Um, it makes sense. And they both have their their own benefits and potential disadvantages. The live ones are like really good at inducing a strong immune response, both like what we call humoral or the antibody formation, as well as cellular or like that T cell response. However, because it's live, it does carry a potential biohazard risk creating or like creating cross reactivity or making um, the immune system respond in a way that we don't want it to. So potentially having more um, adverse events. Does that, that make sense? Totally. And then on the opposite side, the heat and activated ones or the non-live vaccines, also great candidates in general, you know, they also are good at stimulating an immune response, just not quite as much as the live one, but because they're not live, we generally consider them as safer. This all sounds very promising. Not even like the hot topic right now, because that's not the type of vaccine candidate that we are seeing so far anyways for COVID. The other types of vaccines are viral vector, which just means that we we hack the science of how viruses work. So viruses are really good at like getting inside a cell and making what they need to actively replicate 
right? So viral vectors taking a totally harmless uh, virus and using that to get the message to make the protein that's going to train the immune system on what the virus looks like that they have to develop a response to. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. And then another couple of types are what they call either subunit, protein, or conjugate. So that's really just taking a portion of the virus. So protein, so one of the key components of the virus, just taking a little bit of that and then showing the immune system what that looks like. Everything is about just training the immune system on what the virus looks like, that kind of thing. And then finally is genomic, and that is the hot, 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 hot topic of 2020, because that's what we're starting to see is the first emerging vaccine candidates that are getting approved, the mRNA. So mRNA is genomic material. So genomic material is either DNA or RNA. And so what mRNA or genomic vaccines are doing is that is able to help send the code of how to make a part, a portion of the virus, a protein of the virus so that the immune system can, again, see it and develop immunity towards it. And then importantly, the mRNA vaccines, um, while they are genomic, so they're giving you um, the code to write for this part of the um, virus. They do not mess up your human DNA. They do not get incorporated into your DNA. That's not how these work. They're just giving um, your cells, your body, the code to write a portion of, of the virus. Does that make sense? It sure does. Okay, few. Thank you. So those are <laughs> those are the big major types of vaccines. And I just wanted to end with the genomic ones because the mRNA are the big hot candidates that we're starting to see, at least emerging first for COVID. Great. While I say that those are the big hot ones, um, there are actually over 180 vaccines being currently studied for COVID. Can you believe that? <gasps> wow. Yeah. Science says you're welcome. <laughs> so um, have there in previous viruses, have there been as many studies going on in recent times or is this kind of novel for modern science? This is groundbreaking. This is this is a huge scientific achievement that we not only have one that's a mRNA vaccine for COVID that is like probably today, fingers crossed, going to be FDA approved in the United States and has already been used in the UK and was approved in Canada. But we have so many and that's so quickly. This this is a huge scientific achievement. Wow. Mm -hmm. Something humanity should be proud of. Absolutely. It and can be done. It can be learn. done. And, and guess what? It was based off of a bunch of people working together with a shared goal. It's beautiful. Okay. And teamwork. <laughs> teamwork makes the dream work. That's so right. what all of these vaccine candidates for COVID have in, in common, most, if not all of them, are targeting the same part of the COVID virus. They're targeting that spike protein that you hear about so much that kind of gives it the crown-like feature. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's really cool. They all share a common target. Sumara, you are pretty uh, savvy with clinical development being so attuned to the science of NMO. Did you think you could kind of explain like, what the clinical development process looks like before anything gets approved? Sure. From a very high level, it, it's a kind of simple equation. You go from phase one to phase two to phase three, then to FDA approval. And the final phase, phase four, is post-marketing. So phase one, it looks at safety of whatever you know, you're know you studying, in this case, the COVID vaccines and healthy individuals, making sure that there's no serious AEs. And then it goes to phase two. So this is in a, a more people than phase one, where you use it um, to see if you can achieve efficacy and you still study the safety profile. If that all looks good, you move on to phase three with with thousands of patients. So in the case of these COVID vaccines, we have tens of thousands of patients either getting placebo or the vaccine. And then if all those results look good, it goes to the FDA for review, thorough review. And good. Yeah, it is. And what if the FDA, the key scientists and clinicians will review the data, and if they decide that it looks good, the benefit risk profile looks good, that it's efficacious and that it's not um, doing more harm than good, they will approve it. But don't you worry, because even then, the clinical development program is still ongoing. It goes into phase four, where they continue to study the safety of it. Fantastic. So that's all awesome. So all of these big pharma companies that have put their COVID vaccines into development, um, such as Pfizer and Moderna with the mRNA vaccines, they're continuing to do that. And 
to be very frank, the data looks very good. They're very efficacious in the patients that they've been looked at so far to reduce COVID um, disease or um, severe COVID. And yes, the answer it was. Both of them, um, the Pfizer and Moderna ones, were over 90% had efficacy. So that's amazing. I would say a big caveat is that we still don't know yet if the the efficacy of these vaccines in reducing transmission or spread. So it's still really important, I think, for everybody, if they can, to get the vaccine to protect themselves. But until we know how good these vaccines are at reducing transmission. You know, just keep in mind that there's always risk with everything that you put into your body, including vaccines. And the safety profile or the adverse events that they found um, in the clinical trials for the COVID mRNA vaccines were pretty pretty mild. Actually, they, there were no serious adverse events, so that's really encouraging. But what they did see is injection site reactions. So like where they gave you the shot, you might have some pain or some swelling, that kind of thing, a headache, myalgia, or just overall body aches, and fatigue, like pronounced fatigue. So Chelsea, I have a question for you. Yes. Who gets the vaccine first mm-hmm. and when do they start rolling it out? Okay. All of the recommendations for the timeline of the vaccine, like who gets it first, is based off of the CDC and then also implemented with specific policy on a state-by-state basis. So it'll probably look generally very similar across the United States. However, there'll be some caveat or nuances depending on what state you live in. However, that being said, in general, the, the people who will first get it, like as soon as the FDA rolls it out, so here in Ohio, um, we are going to get the vaccine the first vaccine um, by the 15th, so next week. And that will be given to frontline healthcare workers, right? Like the the, the doctors and the nurses who are treating these patients, right? Because they're at the greatest risk of potentially contracting the virus and we obviously need them. And then also people in long-term congregative living, so like nursing homes, for example. So after they receive the first vaccines, then it'll go into high-risk groups. So those will be older individuals and then anybody with underlying medical conditions. And then also essential workers, like people in grocery stores and hospitals and teachers, so the education sector. We've think that these, this first couple of phases of people to get the vaccine, this will start again, probably as early as next week, and then continue on until most of those patients or people get the vaccine. So probably late, late spring. Um, Again, you know, we don't fully know, but this is the general timeline that's being proposed. Okay, got it. And then everybody else, I mean, I'd say everybody else, I mean, the general population, the people who are not of advanced age or people who don't have underlying health conditions and aren't essential health workers will probably start getting it again late May um, and working towards the summer. That is so, so, so exciting. It is so exciting. The gala in October. This is really exciting. And I think after a year of a lot of uncertainty, um, disappointment for mm-hmm, many, mm-hmm. Um, and real real struggle and stress. Uh, they, Like you said earlier, that this looks like there is a light at the end of there the tunnel. Is. And while that's very exciting and the end is near, I think it is important to remind people that you still need to social distance. Absolutely. You still need to wear masks. If you're having symptoms, you need to stay away from people. Do not congregate in, um, you know, large gatherings and until we know for sure that we're in the clear Mm -hmm. we we still have to practice this good behavior yes thank you for saying that Samara that's absolutely important um until Dr. Fauci himself comes out or saying that we have achieved herd immunity please 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 keep practicing social distancing and CDC policy thank you for saying that you know like we said earlier about science um it being a team effort we as humans mm. need to act as if we're on the same team yes. so that we can defeat this, yes. um, our invisible enemy, as I like to call it. Yep. So, and obviously you're going to speak, so for this question is going to be different that for you than for me, but you know, I'm excited to get the COVID vaccine when it is available to me. What are your thoughts on getting the COVID vaccine? 
Well, I definitely am optimistic about it for the general public. And I think also for our community who has been, you know, extra vulnerable to all of this. Me personally, I will take it when it's my turn. Mm -hmm. Um, And even if it means, you know, being the guinea pig for the NMO community, I'm happy to be that person. But I definitely would much rather be vaccinated than not vaccinated. It's important. And again, we can do this together. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. We can get through these next rough months. Social yep. distance, maybe reconsider some of your holiday gatherings, follow your state and local health guidelines. And to achieve herd immunity, we need herd cooperation. And on that very hopeful and inspirational note with Sumaira, we're now going to shift over to conversations specific to considerations of vaccines in the NMO community. And I'm going to shift away and have the expert herself discuss this, Dr. Mary Rensel. Really grateful for her insight. Here we go. Dr. Renzel, this is a really exciting time. At the beginning of the end of the pandemic, we see the silver lining at the end of the tunnel anyway with some of these really promising phase three vaccine trials. And the FDA is meeting, has just had that big committee, and it it looks like things are getting more hopeful. But obviously, this is bringing up a lot of concern and questions regarding vaccines, and especially for patients who have NMO or on immunosuppressive medication. So as a clinician who treats a lot of NMO patients, What are some general vaccine recommendations for NMO? Right. So, yeah, thank you for having me. This is exciting to be able to talk about, uh, like I said, the beginning of the end, hopefully. Yes. That's what we're all hoping for. So, you know, a lot of times our recommendations have to go off of, uh, obviously, led by science, but some of it we have to kind of put together different information from different trials. Mm Mm-hmm. So what we can look at is we can look at some of the medicines that are used for NMO folks, but we're we're used in different disease states. Like So let's say rheumatoid arthritis patients, um, there's been some vaccine studies back since 2014. There's one in a French series, an Iranian series, a Chinese series, looking at what happens when they're on long-term immunosuppressive medicine Mm -hmm. and how much can they mount a response to a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Because that's a mere, that's a million dollar question. Right, right. Can they, you know, there's a term called zero convert, and then uh, and then are they zero protected? So mm-hmm. that means, you know, are, did the vaccine actually work? Will it protect them from a disease? So for us to say uh, this potential COVID vaccine that will hopefully be out, you know, right now here we are uh, mid December, and hopefully it's coming any minute to at least some select people. It's a new kind of vaccine, new meaning new to us as, as everyday use. So there are no studies with these, this kind of messenger mm-hmm. RNA vaccine and NMO patients and their medication. But I want to say that messenger RNA vaccines, when we say they're new, they've been in, in trials since the 90s. So I, I, I hear a lot of worry that they're new, but they're actually, um, there's a lot of studies behind that kind of vaccine. So the first thing is we can go off some of the old um, studies from uh, rheumatoid arthritis and medications like rituxan, mm-hmm. methotrexate. Like some of the old methotrexate studies show that maybe there is a decreased response to the flu vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine. And same thing with rituxan. The, one of the best studies was just published this year, at least for the medication like a B cell medication, and this is with MS folks, but we we can extrapolate a bit if mm-hmm. we have to. Um, so that's the VELOCE study that was just published this year. And so that was a really well done study um, looking at the vaccine response if people were zero protected. And so that was mostly to different strains of uh, the flu vaccine. And people on B cell therapy, which is similar to some of the NMO medicines, they could mount a 55 to 80 percent response and they were zero protected. So that was pretty great, right? So we knew that 80 percent of the patients, 55 to 80 percent of the patients could mount a good response to the flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. Now, it it would take, you know, an expert in vaccines to tell us, well, you know, that flu vaccine is not the messenger RNA vaccine that we're going to all hope for for the uh, for COVID, um, to fight COVID and block COVID. So we are in a territory we've never been, right? So right. we have a new kind of vaccine, a new pandemic. Do any of them the animal medicines, because of the way they work, would they be maybe, would they change the way the messenger RNA vaccine would work? The sarcolizumab, that's, you know, uh, complement related. Mm-hmm. So that's 
something that helps kind of turn on or off or connect the immune players will say and we don't you know that's the question i guess maybe that's your expertise we just don't know i wish we could we could hy- hypothesize and talk theoretics which i you know would rather not do but yeah we just don't know unfortunately yeah. we need that data yeah. And that's actually what we heard from the scientific panel yesterday is that we're not, they're not sure what to do with folks who are immunosuppressed with this, this messenger RNA type of vaccine. Mm-hmm. So we are hoping for more trials. And the reality of the vaccines, as we heard, is that unfortunately, these, you know, people may still be getting vaccinated all the way through the summer mm-hmm. of 2021. So that may give us some time to get more scientific information for folks living with NMO and others that are chronically immunosuppressed so that we could see if they are still able to mount a response to this messenger RNA, this, this new, newish, you know, kind of vaccine. So that's great. And that's around, um, you know, general considerations for efficacy in response to vaccination. And it seems like, long story short, obviously, we just don't know specific to the new emerging COVID mRNA vaccines, but extrapolating from other types of vaccines in patients um, on other similar immunosuppressive medications, it looks like maybe they have um, a slightly uh, attenuated response, but they still are showing protective immunity upon vaccination. Right, which okay. is wonderful. So okay. in that one study, you know, that was a flu vaccine and a pneumonia vaccine study that was published this year. So the, the comparison was people not on that medicine, they could mount a response 75 to 97 percent of them were zero protected or protected against the flu or pneumonia. And when they were on a medicine, it was 55 to 80 okay. percent were protected. So it was very uh, it was decreased, but it was uh, a great amount of people that were protected. Right. So there's still some benefit of getting vaccinated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because we do know that, you know, one thing that is a trigger for relapses in NMO is infection, mm-hmm. right? So we mm-hmm. want to do everything we can to prevent infections. And flu is a preventable, you know, infection in a lot of cases. So, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely we recommend getting the flu vaccine because the flu vaccine is inactivated. It's not a live vaccine and it doesn't have a risk like we used to think that, you know, some of the old flu vaccines were live mm-hmm. and so you could actually get the flu, but we don't really have to worry about that recently in the last few years with the flu vaccine. So that kind of gets into the next topic of safety. So it sounds like when there's a live or a live attenuated vaccine, that's when you seem to have some hesitancy regarding safety and potential like triggering of uh, symptoms or relapse potentially, but there's less concern around the non-live vaccines. Yeah. And we, right, cause we want to do everything we can do to prevent infection. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this We've all learned in the last eight months to wash our hands mm-hmm. regularly and for a long, longer than we like and to not touch right. our eyes or our face. And we know why, because that's how we get infections into our body, through our eyes or our mouth. We have been talking about that for years and years, but now everyone's heard that, you know, so many times because of the pandemic risk. So that goes on. So when people are chronically immunosuppressed on medications to treat their NMO, that, that will continue for them, that, that part. You know, good hand washing, don't touch your face. That's just for all of us, especially if you're immunosuppressed, that's even higher on the list. And then, yeah, absolutely get vaccinated. That's where you need to see your primary care doctor regularly and keep up with your uh, preventative care, we call it. So how do you prevent infections and other medical conditions as you see your primary care doc depending on your family history and your age, you know, how to mm-hmm. do screening blood tests or maybe a mammogram or prostate exam, depending on your age and sex and family risk. So those are super important, when, especially when you're chronically immunosuppressed, incredibly important, right? right? So we want, that's part of our care, even though you might have to see a neurologist regularly, also primary care for sure. Yeah. I think that um, I've heard in the NMO community or just patients who have these neuroimmune conditions, um, there is some hesitancy or concern because they've heard of uh, patients getting Guillain-Barre after vaccination. And I think that that kind of touches similarly to potential for NMO flare-ups, um, that kind of thing. Could you speak to that a little bit? That is a rare risk of uh, especially the flu vaccine. And so if you ever, if anyone ever had Guillain-Barre with a flu vaccine, you wouldn't want to get it, get the flu vaccine, especially that kind. So there's some nuances to that. Uh-huh. Um, you can always see like an infectious disease doc to get more information about what vaccines may be okay. Guillain-Barre is not NMO. Those two different situations, you know, so mm-hmm. it's not a myelitis like what we could see with, with, um, with NMO. It's a different kind of 
uh, disease and it affects the nerves in a different spot. But it, the symptoms can seem kind of similar because it could be numbness and weakness and trouble breathing like it could be with uh, NMO, spinal cord, uh, myelitis. We're not sure. I mean, we have to say we're not sure. I mean, NMO yeah, is a rare yeah. disease. Um, you know, when they do trials with these vaccines, we know they put healthy people in the trials. They tend to put, um, they weren't, the, you know, the panel yesterday said they thought 16 years old and older were, um, they seemed okay. But we also know as we age, we're less responsive to vaccines. So sometimes as people age, they get kind of a heavier dose of the vaccine. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot to be figured out. Yep. Um, and and un- unfortunately or fortunately, it's going to take more science mm-hmm. to figure out mm-hmm. the best plan for folks who live with NMO that will need to be done and uh, before we have some certainty of how this particular vaccine will work with the different kind of NMO medications. We have some sense of how you know, certain kinds of the uh, of the medications do with at least the B cell therapies, but we we don't have a lot of data on the other kind of medications at this point. Uh, but that's today. <laughs> there's one thing that's changing, and that's happening lately. Right? It's changed, right? So, you know, the, there's a lot of uncertainties. But I think we do know that certain medicines, like we can say, the old the oral medications like the methotrexate, et cetera, we see a decreased effectiveness to the flu and the pneumococcal. Mm-hmm. So, so we can go over some old science, uh, but it would be real nice to have some new science. Yes. Well, thank you so much. And overall, obviously, we have to be cautiously optimistic. There does seem to be a light at the end of the tunnel with these promising vaccines. Obviously, like you said, we need more data to more specifically understand benefit risk for NMO patients in particular treatments. Mm-hmm. That being said, Obviously, and you are someone who is living with not NMO, but will you get the COVID vaccine? Yeah, I mean, we we like to follow science here, right? I work at Cleveland Clinic, and, <laughs> and that's what we follow. So we've been waiting to see more details from the trial, and we were excited to see that the you know the scientific panel yesterday they had more details about the trial, the trials, and so you know that's yeah. So we're just we're anxiously waiting, and there's a plan here at Cleveland Clinic to start vaccinating caregivers, especially caregivers who are taking care of our very sickest patients, so mm-hmm. that they can um, have safety and um, a safe environment and to keep be able to treat our patients who really need um, ICU care, et cetera. So Cleveland Clinic has a plan and um, the state has a plan and each state has a plan on how to distribute the vaccines. We only can do what we can control, right? So I think the best thing is to see your neurologist, see your primary care doc, do everything you can preventatively. You know, it seems so silly, but washing your hands is super important and helpful and wearing a mask right now and, you know, just staying away from big crowds. And and unfortunately, we all have to stay home for the holidays. Yeah. Um, But in in hopes that, you know, next year will be a whole new year. Definitely. Um, Yes, we have to get through this rough stretch, but hope is on the way. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Rensel, for coming and hopping on this podcast to speak to NMO patients. 